Turning our attention now to Athens, Georgia, for the pretrial hearing in the murder of Lake and Riley case. A judge is hearing arguments today on the possible exclusion of DNA evidence against the defendant, Jose Ibarra. He is accused of killing nursing student Lake and Riley on the campus of the University of Georgia back in February of just this year. Before we go back into court, I want to bring in Court TV field reporter Cody Thomas, who's on the ground today covering today's action. Cody, always great to be on on with you. Tell us what is the latest in that courtroom today? Well, good afternoon to you too, Judge Ashley. The first motion argued in court today was a motion to suppress cell phone data acquired from Jose Ibarra's two cell phones. Now, the police, once they detained Ibarra, took two cell phones from his house. The defense says that the Sorry about that. The defense says that his phones were taken by police. Um, investigators attempted to search one of the phones without having a warrant, but the prosecution says that police searched those phones after an official warrant was obtained. Take a listen to some of those arguments, testimony, and the defense's response today on the stand. With 1B7 being locked, could you have searched the phone without Cellubrite Premium? No. Why not? I couldn't get into the device without having some tool to guess the pattern lock to unlock the device. So there was no way to get into the specimen without using Celebrate Premium. Um, there are other tools on the market, such as Gray Key, but we did not have an Android license for the Gray Key. So the only option I had was Celebrate Premium. To this Ruben data, um, that is also could be the phone just talking to the tower, right? Yes. Okay. And that doesn't mean someone searched the phone, is that right? Correct. Uh, no one could have searched this particular, if we're talking about 1B7, no one could have searched it because it was locked. The phones were not kept safe, number one. They were tampered with. Number two, Agent Karate said that he tried to access the phone. He was caught in the act by the third eye intruder. It may be that he was only trying to put it in airplane mode, but the point of the matter is, without a warrant, they tried to enter Mr. Ibarra's phone. That is exactly what our case law prohibits them doing. Now, Judge Ashley, the judge did not make a ruling on that motion to suppress that cell phone data. And actually, this hearing did just wrap up a few minutes ago. They argued for a little bit over some litigation about that crucial DNA evidence, the fingerprint found from Jose Bar on Lake and Riley's cell phone and the DNA evidence found under Lake and Riley's fingernails. The judge also did not make a ruling on whether that will be excluded. The defense had filed a motion to exclude that, uh, that DNA evidence from the trial, but no decisions were officially made today in court. Thank you so much to you, Cody, because this is all very important information. It determines what they can actually use in court to prove he did it according to the state. All right, thank you again. We want to get back into court now to bring you some of the arguments. The attorneys at this point are arguing over the cell phone evidence. Anything else in the way of evidence? Not in the way of evidence from the state. Nothing else from the defense, Your Honor. Okay. Y'all want to do argument related to this now? Yes, please. If we can, Your Honor. Who would you like to proceed first, Your Honor? This was the state's original motion. They go, you go, yes, sir. they go. Well, okay, yes, sir. Um, this evidence that we presented today um, is in response to the defendant's amended motion to suppress, which was filed after our last hearing. And in that motion to suppress, the defense alleges um, that they had evidence that would contradict um, that the phone was not searched uh, or that the phone was searched prior to the warrant. So let me say that the other way around. I apologize. Uh, the state's position is, and the evidence has shown, that while 1B7 and 1B8 were seized without a warrant, which we have already covered uh, the last hearing, and I don't wish to cover unless the court wishes me to recover that. I do not. Okay, thank you. Um, that those phones were not searched until a search warrant was obtained. And in fact, there you've now heard and you knew from last time there were two search warrants, three total, but for each phone, two, two warrants for the phones. 
Um, we are here today because the defense filed the amended motion saying that they had evidence that that's not true. And I think the evidence has been really clear in the hearing today that what happened to 1B7 is that Special Agent Karate tried to put it in airplane mode, couldn't. The phone was locked. He couldn't unlock it. He didn't search it. It was left at the, with the GBI. Eventually, it made its way to UGA PD, where Agent Hipkiss picked it up, not in airplane mode, and in a Faraday bag. And then it had to be uh, physically broken into by Cellubrite Premium. Uh, there's no way it is even possible, and the evidence is uncontroverted at this point, that agents law enforcement officers or anyone could search that phone prior to Judge Stevens signing that warrant on February 27th. It's clear from even the own Cellubrite reports that the defense made and put into evidence. Candace Hunter at the FBI was the only person who could open that phone and she did so only after receiving that warrant from Judge Stevens in the manner in which has been described to you. Um, I hear this complaint uh, coming that they uh, exceeded the scope of the warrant. Well, let me tell you who exceeded the scope of the warrant. The defense did. The first time Special Agent Hipkiss even saw data that predated uh, what Judge Stevens offered him, allowed him to take, is when the defense created those exhibits and gave it to him. He testified to this court, and you will, I'm sure, uh, in camera review his seizure report. And his seizure report was set at the parameters in which Judge Stevens authorized him to search. And he was permitted to look at items which had no date on it to determine whether, in fact, they fell within the scope of the warrant. And if they did not fall within the scope of the warrant, he didn't tag them. If they did fall within the scope of the warrant, he tagged them. And tagging them really is just their way of saying he seized them. And they are in those reports that have been admitted to you as State's Exhibit 31. From the plain language of Judge Stevens' warrant, he allowed the FBI to download the entire phone. Not only does it make um, logical sense that that's the only way they could do it, so it would be like saying, I guess the defense is trying to tell this court, and I'd like to see some legal authority on it, that you can search the phone, but we're just not going to allow you to download it. Well, then you're back to what Special Agent Hipkiss said. Well, we're just going to have to physically go through the phone. And if you do that, then you're absolutely looking at everything in the phone. There is a tapestry of cases out there, and I'm, I'm happy to provide them to the court about this, this theory. And it's not a new theory. Um, and I would say that defense's argument is rather novel. Um, there's definitely no evidence that somebody got into that phone before it was cracked. So that's just, there's just no evidence to support that allegation. Um, but what they're trying to tell this court is that, well, you, you're going to have to search the phone without unlocking it. Um, there are cases out there when it comes to computer searches. And in Riley v. California, when we first started this cell phone journey a long time ago with the United States Supreme Court, um, they likened, and Judge Roberts likened cell phones to microcomputers. And when searching computers, and I think all the case law associated with the search of computers is very helpful here. Um, and I guess my argument is two things. One, they didn't exceed the scope. Judge Stevens authorized exactly what happened here, and they, they processed the warrant in the way that he authorized it. Um, and number two, if, if they think that the scope succeeded, we're not using anything that's not in Special Agent Hipkiss's report, so it's moot, and there's no harm. And three, and finally, they're asking you to, to establish some kind of procedure where you're allowed to search a file cabinet for the tax returns from 2020, but you can't look at all of the other items in the file to see if they are in fact the tax return from 2020. I mean, if you want to just relate it to other objects or relate it to computers. And so for um, computers, and I have a few cases to cite for the court, and I can provide them um, in writing as well if the court wants a brief on it. But quite frankly, uh, United States versus Kahani, K-H-A-N-A-N-I at 502 Fed 3rd.